Good morning, and welcome to Morning Devotions. We are in Acts chapter 18 today, at verse 1. And today we're wondering, I have a piece of very, very heavy canvas. It's actually a part of an old army cot, I think. I actually think it might be a World War II army cot. I mean, certainly the way it was constructed, it was difficult to put together. And not the modern uh, handy stuff. We'll think about that. We're going to sing just a couple verses of How Clear Is Our Vocation, Lord. I don't know who Fred Pratt Green was, uh, the uh, author of this hymn, but I wish he'd written more. This is an outstanding hymn, and uh, we need more hymns on this topic, on this theme. Um, how we in our daily lives live and with our daily daily work serve the Lord. How clear is our vocation, Lord, when once we heed your call to live according to your word and daily learn refreshed, restored that you are Lord of all. What you give us, Lord, to do, together or alone, in old routines or ventures new, may we not cease to look to you, the cross you hung upon, all you All you endeavored. All of Jesus' work, because Jesus had an occupation too, didn't he? All that Jesus did, done. So we're in Acts chapter 18, at verse 1. We see Paul had been in Athens. I so uh, regret that I missed the chance to have a devotion on that part. Pastor Rago did an outstanding job with that. But that's one of my favorite texts, and we often use it here at St. Paul as sort of a summary of our ministry, that last half of chapter 17. But in chapter 18, he leaves Athens. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with his entire household. And many of the Christians hearing Paul believed, and many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. And Paul stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. <laughs> this is a very interesting chapter. Paul in Corinth. Corinth is just that one of those places where everything seems to happen. And we have two of Paul's letters uh, two of the three that he wrote, we have two of Paul's letters to Corinth, um, filled with debate and 
dissension and issues and all kinds of crazy things that have that went on in this place and yet it was a place where Paul was able to remain for a year and a half and teach <clears throat> excuse me because uh, God gave him a peaceful or, or a, uh, a break from the you know the riots and beatings and that sort of thing um, several fascinating things in here uh, the as usual he teaches in the synagogue for a time and then there's opposition as some Gentiles come to faith and people don't like that and so some of the Jews are for him and some of the Jews are against him and there's this split in the congregation and so Paul leaves but he goes next door he's right next door to the synagogue every day teaching and so these Jewish people are still there hearing the gospel and many come to faith and in fact the ruler of the synagogue comes to faith but a few verses later a year and a half later he's not ruler of the synagogue anymore now, it's, uh, he's been kicked out, I'm sure, because he became a believer in Jesus. So then it becomes this uh, Sosthenes. Doesn't help Sosthenes much <clears throat> that, he's, that he's faithful. The, the, uh, uh, the angry uh, people who had stir tried, to, tried to get Paul arrested uh, take out their anger on their own uh, synagogue ruler, Sosthenes, and they beat him up. So there's all kinds of things going on here. It's fascinating. And Paul's preaching and teaching. What we forget, though, is it was right at the beginning of the chapter. What's a good-sized piece of Paul's day? What's he doing? He's not just always preaching the gospel and teaching and bringing people to faith. No. He's making tents out of heavy fabric like this. I, I, I remember I took this... this uh, cot apart. We got much more comfortable things to sleep on after that. Uh, but this was a, an army cot that served the family in good stead for a long time. And I couldn't stand to throw away this canvas. It's a good canvas. I thought, I'll use this for something. And so I folded it up and I put it back here on my workbench and, and I thought about it. But this is, this is difficult stuff to work with. It is uh, thick and heavy and running a needle through it, you, you'd have to poke the hole first with an awl or something and, and then thread your needle through and it would, be, it would be tiresome work to use that. I have another tent back here. Look at this baby. This is huge. This is a pavilion tent. It's a, it is a, a six-sided screen tent that we got for when, our, for when our kids were all home. So we could all gather outside and play games away from the mosquitoes. That's what Paul was doing. He was laboring. He was, you know, with the eye, the close eye work, stick the all in there, make the hole, thread the needle back and forth. Just this rather tedious, rather tedious, rather uh, wearing, hard on the back, you're sitting, you're leaning over, hard on the eyes, you're peering close up, hard on the hands, uh, holding you know, the needle and the all, and you poke yourself and you. Um, uh, Paul had a hard job and, and every time he was sitting and threading you know, a needle in and out of this heavy fabric don't you think he was saying I could be doing something for the Lord I could be doing something important oh why am I stuck here he even tells he even tells the Corinthians in one of his letters to them he says I supported myself while I was with you so that I wouldn't burden you he worked on his own to support his ministry. And he, says, he even says, I asked other congregations to help me so that I wouldn't have to burden you. So other congregations gave him funding so that he would have to not work as much uh, in order to be able to devote himself to sharing the word. But his work in making tents, that was important enough that God allowed that to, to be a thing to be something that he was doing instead of preaching the gospel. You know, I, I remember when I got out of college and I was planning to go on to seminary, but we wanted Karen to get some teaching experience before we went to the seminary because there's lots of Lutheran schools around there, but there are lots of pastors or seminary wives that are also teachers, and we thought it might be hard for her to get a teaching job. So we wanted her to use her teaching degree. And, uh, and so before we went to seminary, we... We left school for a couple years. <clears throat> she went to teach at Redeemer in Saginaw. 
And I was, uh, at first I was working in a, in a shopping mall, Fashion Square Mall, uh, as, a, as a maintenance guy, cleaning fountains and that kind of thing. And then I got a job in a machine shop up there. And day after day I would go into work, in my grubby clothes, and stand in front of a machine and turn the handles and make these things, you know, just working with steel. And I thought, I should be, I should be working in the church. I should be moving on to seminary. I, I should be, you know, doing something for the Lord. No. God called me there at that time. God has called you to where you are. We call it a vocation. A calling. That's what that means. Not an occupation. When you have a job, you have an occupation, and that means you fill up space, right? You occupy it, you take up space, it, or it takes up space in your life. But a vocation, that's, that's a calling. You are called to what you do. I don't know what it is. It might be watching children. It might be uh, standing in front of a machine. It might be sitting at a desk in front of a computer, working with numbers. It might be filling out forms. It, it, might, be, uh, it might be waiting by the phone for grandchildren to call. And yet, even there, you make a difference in the lives of others. Not just me doing these devotions, you doing whatever God has called you to do. How clear is our vocation, Lord, our calling, when once we heed your call. When we listen to the Lord, then all of a sudden our purpose, our, our calling is clear. We're called to where we are, to the people that he loves that are near us. As Paul made tents, he sat with Priscilla and Aquila, and they talked and they built one another up and he prepared them also to take over after him when he left, when he moved on. He had influence over others as well. He could, he could sew and talk at the same time. You too. Whatever God has called you to do, do it well. Do it with all your heart today. It's your calling. Heavenly Father, it takes so many different kinds of people so many different tasks, everyone with, with their different cares and concerns, everyone with different burdens, but we all labor together to make a, an economy, a society. We piece them all together and we serve one another, and in doing so, we serve you. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ today who are weary of their work, for those who have no clarity about why they are where they're at, Lord, open their eyes today to see your calling in their life. Not a calling to run away, but the, a calling, as you said to Paul, to stay where he was for a time, a calling to remain and to see more deeply into what they're doing, and to appreciate that all you endeavor is done, that you are working through us, and you will accomplish your good will today. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. You have a great Tuesday.